So to introduce the company, Stratic Systems, as I say, we're a software company uh, focused on strategy and risk, but really focused on giving you the tools to enhance your capability to execute strategy, improve your capital efficiency, and drive down operational losses. And do all those things whilst also providing confidence that you're operating within the risk appetite boundaries set by your board or operating within appetite. And you'll see there we've got you know nice pretty dashboards on um, in the solution and also um, just some nice results there from one of our early clients about the benefits I've got from delivering uh, deploying our solution over over the two or three year period. So uh, Early last year, about eight, nine months ago now, we've seen the FCA come into creation. And they've really changed the regulatory approach. Um, and one of the key things they've done is they have brought with them the concept of conduct risk. Um, and there's a definition here of conduct risk, but one of the things they've also brought, I think it's fair to say, is um, some confusion. So as you'd expect, the FCA have published um, information about uh, conduct risk and, and business standards and how to uh, business best practice through the handbook. Um, there is definition for both conduct risk and risk, conduct risk appetite in, in the market. But the FCA themselves have been very clear. There is, they do not provide a standard definition of conduct risk and to date they have not been clear about their expectations and that's where the confusion comes from. So in, pre in preparing this webinar I looked to the FCA website and also or specifically looked at some of the speeches that have been made recently. So starting with a speech that given by Clive Adamson uh, in October last year and this starts to or try to kind of get a feel for what the expectation really is from the FCA. So we can see here that um, there's really Clive's talking about a change in a philosophical, a philosophical change in the way that regulation is carried out and specifically picks up on the point that, when, that firms are not expected to comply with a narrow set of regulatory rules, but the FC, FCA wants to see a fundamental change in business approach, in business model, culture, business practice, etc. So it's a it's a very it's a more holistic view that the FCA is kind of taking, and they're expecting their firms to be able to demonstrate that they have implemented such a uh, holistic approach and perhaps less worried about checking uh, regulatory boxes. Clive also mentions um, you know, putting, putting customers at the heart of business strategy, which is, which is one of the strap lines that I think the FCA, FCA has really pushed over the last year or so, and doing it in a way that is commercially sustainable. I think that's an interesting point, but recognizing that firms need to make a return that they can stay in business. Now looking at um, Linda Woodall's speech to the Council of Mitch Lenders, and that was in November last year. She talks about uh, how the FCA is different from the FSA, and she highlights three things, greater use of, of judgment, more forward looking, and more outcomes focused. She also makes the interesting comment that, that this fat phrase, conduct risk, has reached almost mythical status. And she makes it very clear that there is no standard definition. They do not have a kind of one fit all um, regulatory framework which they are seeking to apply. 
So what does the FCA really want from its regulated firms? Well, what I've tried to do is I've tried to summarise in a few points what we're hearing from our customers and also what we're hearing from the FCA itself and, and looking obviously at their website and, and perhaps some of these features. So obvious first point there is customer at the heart of your business model and strategy. Um, the second point is firms should make good profits, i.e. make profits out of delivering the right product and services to the right customer at the right time, as opposed to engaging in any mis-selling activity such as the PPI um, scandal that unfolded over the last few years. The FCA also want to see a strategic approach where your board and your senior management are engaged in ensuring that customer outcomes are delivered, good customer outcomes are delivered, ensuring that the support processes around that, the new product development processes, the customer services processes, the complaints handling processes, all of those processes are aligned and delivering good customer outcomes. And cultural change and accountability is also a strong theme that comes through. Um, and I think the FCA recognise both individual firms and the industry needs to um, undergo some cultural change to win back the trust and, and um, of, of the investing public. Also, um, one of the key points that comes out is not a narrow focus on, on compliance to regulatory rules. And I think that's an area you know, the last few months we've seen a slight change in tone from the FCA, but it's also a message I don't think is reaching the market uh, as loudly as it could. The FCA is not looking for us to look at a, a, a large number of specific rules and tick boxes there. They're looking for a fundamental change in approach and the way we run businesses. So that, that brings us to how do we think we should um, meet the requirements of the FCA when they are so, perhaps we could call them ill-defined, slightly vague, a little bit woolly. We think there's three things you need to focus in on. One is taking a risk-based approach to managing your firm. The second we want to discuss is um, using a proven approach to drive change and, and sustain change over time. And thirdly, we'll talk about enabling, using enabling software such as our, our Stratex point solution to really embed, embed change and ensure that you can efficiently and effectively manage the uh, processes around risk, uh, conduct risk, manage the data and information around conduct risk, and ensure that the management information and decision support information you need is produced in a timely fashion. So we'll start off by looking at um, taking a risk-based approach. And it, literally, we wrote the book on this topic. We're the first to really um, bring together these two um, management disciplines of, of strategy, execution, enterprise performance management, and risk management, particularly enterprise and risk, and enterprise and operational risk. And in this book, we've really outlined a, an approach that we think is, is very strong and very robust and has proven over the years with various clients. So the approach we're talking about is we call risk-based performance management. And it's very much a holistic approach. Uh, it starts off with strategy, so very much about saying what are, the, what are our strategic objectives, what's our underlying business model look like, and then it goes into appetite, which is a central concept for the methodology. And really, the way the strategy and the appetite piece work is is really saying if we've seen, if we've defined a set of strategic objectives. How much risk and what type of risk are we willing to run to deliver on those objectives? So 
risk appetite has a fundamental part to play here early on in the process, but also as we go through um, our strategy execution phase. We have a performance management piece, which is all about understanding are we on track to achieve our objectives, and a risk management piece, which is all about definition of key risks, uh, and understanding our current level of exposure, and finally, is that level of exposure aligned to our risk appetite? And that methodology, that those are what we describe as the hard factors, are supported by a governance and communication layer, and finally a culture layer. And ultimately, we believe that culture is the ultimate uh, strategy execution and risk management tool. Get the culture right, and and many other things follow. So the risk performance management methodology is underpinned by seven key disciplines. Firstly, setting a strategy, which we've talked about. Then there's the performance management piece, the risk management piece, the appetite alignment, and this is really where we bring together performance management and risk management. And really, it's that whole align, alignment piece where we are proactively and continuously checking that the level of risk we're currently taking is aligned to our appetite. And then we're into the softer disciplines of governance, so how do we make decisions and how do we implement those decisions within the business. Communication, so how do we communicate to the, to out to the business about this whole area of strategy and risk and what does that look like and what's the kind of comms approach we take. And finally, number seven is culture. Uh, culture has a number of definitions, uh, many that vary. I like the one which is basically how do we do things around here. Really simple, really straightforward, easy to understand. At the top of these uh, disciplines, we also have what we call business drivers. And business drivers are really those handful of success factors that are common throughout your industry and apply to you as a business and, and, and the rest of your competitors in the industry. So the success factors that really say, what are, what are the one or two things that every business needs to do well in this particular industry to really be success, successful? What's that small handful? And, and a number of financial services firms, given the diversity of those firms, will have multiple business models within their, their, uh, their, their umbrella brand. You only need to think about the universal banking model, retail banking versus um, investment banking as an example, where there are two very different business models often existing in, in one organization. So it's, that's really about capturing that business model and driving out of those few success factors. And then finally, we have the shareholder value. So what we're saying is if we understand our business drivers, we manage the business well through the seven disciplines, then we should generate um, above expectation or above expectation to uh, shareholder value. One of the things I will show you in a moment is how we use how we put the customer value before shareholder value. So the whole methodology is built around the idea that you only create shareholder value after you've created value for your customer. And that leads us nicely into a discussion about one of the key tools that we use in the methodology, which is the strategy map. One of the key things that I've done while putting this uh, methodology together is I haven't sought to reinvent the wheel. I've sought to build on existing tools. And the strategy map is, is key to that. And that's been around 20 years, and it's a great tool for capturing on one page what your organizational strategy is and what the objectives you're trying to achieve are. The whole concept behind the strategy map is about using cause and effect diagrams, relationships to understand how you create value from intangible assets. 
So in this case, we've got a financial objective of increased shareholder value, and you can trace how uh, at the people level, you can, if you, by increasing uh, increasing the retention of competent staff by 10%, that flows through to increased uh, investment ret uh, returns by 25. That flows through to positive customer outcomes. It flows through to positive shareholder value uh, financial outcomes. So that's the whole idea behind the strategy map. It's the whole idea of understanding what are we trying to achieve from a financial perspective to deliver those results. What do we need to achieve from a customer perspective? What internal processes do we need to have in place to enable us to deliver those customer outcomes and deliver those financial objectives? And finally, at the learning and growth level, um, what are the, the cultural, or the people, systems, information usage kind of objectives? What kind of business do we want to build to enable us to execute those internal processes and therefore generate? both customer outcomes and, and financial outcomes. Around the strategy, around each objective, the strategy map suggests we should be defining key performance indicators which have targets and are supported by a series of change initiatives. So that is standard strategy map architecture. And we build on that to say, actually, as well as those performance management dimensions, you should add in your appetite. So when you're thinking about your strategic objectives, what level of risk and what type of risk are we willing to run to ensure we deliver this particular objective? And then on that, and then you can also implement risk assessment processes to understand the level of exposure you currently have, and then look at your alignment between exposure and appetite. You can also use your objectives as kind of a starting point in your uh, definition of your risks. Um, and so for every objective, what are your key risks for that objective? What are the thresholds, so your appetite and, 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 and tolerances? And then what are your mitigations? From a conduct risk point of view, this conversation would focus in on the customer perspective, the outcomes. So the strategy map provides this nice structure which really helps organizations think through what their financial objectives are and then to achieve those financial objectives what are the critical uh, conduct the outcomes or customer outcomes we need to see how do we express them in customer language so that we can deliver our financial objectives then we've got uh, to achieve our financial and customer outcomes what are internal processes and what kind of organization do we need to develop and, and, and build? In addition to the strategy map, we use this four perspective um, risk map, and those perspectives align to the perspectives of the strategy map. And we have found that it gives our clients greater clarity as to exactly what the nature of key risks they have. And what we often see is a clustering of risks around the financial and customer perspective. And by implementing this tool, people start rethinking that because actually they often risks are defined as the outcomes and consequences rather than the event itself. And you see a kind of a move from, of risk from financial and customer down to um, internal processes and learning and growth. And that allows us to say, for example, in the in context of uh, conduct risk, to really focus in on that quadrant, the number two quadrant there. What are the risks specifically related to our customer outcomes? And then also focus in on three and four. What are those enablers that we need to really focus in on to ensure that we can deliver our customer outcomes? So it just helps in clarifying thinking around risk, but also helps in the management of risk. Another um, innovation that we've brought into our software and, and through our methodology is this appetite alignment matrix. And this is a tool, a dashboard that we have seen really 
change the conversation around risk at a number of our clients. And what you can do with this tool is you can plot on onto the matrix um, business units or objectives or risks. It, you know, there's an option to do either of those. And the idea is for any item plotted on the, the green diagonal cells, we can say that they are aligned, meaning the amount of risk exposure around that particular item is aligned to the appetite. It's, it's at the level we, we are happy to accept. Items above those green cells we describe as being overexposed, so this is places where we're taking too much risk, and items under it is where we're not taking enough. And it's really this um, latter ca 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 category of underexposed risks or controls, uh, risks or objectives, that's the most interesting. That's really what shapes and changes the conversation. Most risk professionals are used to seeing situations where there's too much risks and implementing control frameworks and other initiatives to bring that down. What's more, what's different and shapes changes the conversation is where we say, okay, these are areas we're not taking enough risk, and by not taking enough risk, we're increasing the likelihood that we won't hit our strategic objectives. That's really a different way of thinking about risk and changes the conversation between the risk professionals and the business. The approach also gives us a, a tool or a way of thinking about um, our operational neighbors. So in this case, you know, particularly key processes, key operational processes, such as new product development, sales execution, customer service, complaints, handling, etc. For those client facing processes, we can capture those and embed in that, that sort of embedded in the framework and, and captured in the software so that we can align those to the um, our strategic objectives using these operational alignment uh, matrices. And this allows us to, to understand all the operational processes or a change uh, management initiative, how do they align to objectives and specifically how do they help us deliver our customer outcomes and deliver our customer commitments. So that's a little about the approach. Now let's talk about how we might implement such an approach. And really, the whole methodology includes um, a very structured uh, implementation process and also kind of a review process. And one of the key things here is we really differentiate between strategy formulation and, and the role of the board and thinking about where to take business and where the business should go and the strategy execution process or more in the executive accountabilities. So once that strategy is set, objectives determined, the executive take over and, and execute that strategy. Obviously there's there's some blurred lines there, but we'll focus on the execution piece. And one of the key things that um, this uh, implementation plan gives you is it gives you the ability to focus either strategically, so you can start off by saying, right, we have our strategic objectives, we understand our customer outcomes, we understand what we're trying to deliver, let's now put in place a set of strategic risks and controls that help us manage those, and then into indicators and assessments and things. Or you might decide you want to take a more operational process uh, approach first, so you can then start to, you can say, right, we've got our objectives in place, we've know where our customer outcomes are, we've kind of set the context, now let's put it now make sure we've got the operational processes in place and our change management um, agenda in place to ensure that we can deliver on that and then define your risks and controls, etc. So that's a, that's a good kind of step by step process for adding and creating that change. As well as um, creating a change, you need to think about how you sustain it. And one of the tools that we found to be particularly useful in this area is the uh, racing model. Um, and what that does is it basically allows you to go beyond the sort of normal who's the risk owner kind of question to really defining 
who is the accountable person for this particular risk? Who is the responsible people for this particular risk? The difference between accountable and responsible, the accountable is the sort of ultimate authority, the ultimate the person who is ultimately accountable for the management of the risk or delivery of the objective, and the responsible are the people who are helping that person manage that risk or deliver the objective. Consult is the people that we want to keep in the loop. So once, uh, once if there needs to be a major decision about the risk of control, we know who we need to consult before we make that decision. And the informers are the people we inform after we've made the decision. Feedback from our clients around this model is that it's powerful because it goes beyond sort of ill-defined concept of say a risk owner. And it also forces conversations about what role do I really play in relation to a specific risk or a specific control and in the overall process. Am I accountable? Am I responsible? Which items I, am I accountable for? Which items am I responsible for? The other piece of feedback is uh, clients find this really clarifies and improves the, uh, the meetings and decision making processes because it's clear who is the accountable people, who, who has the information, the most input, and who actually goes out there and has to execute the decisions. Now we'll come on to the software. So we'll introduce Stratex Point, which is the solution we deliver. Um, as I said, mentioned earlier, it's built on the SharePoint platform. Uh, we talk about the product being comprehensive in nature, but modular in deployment. I'd just like to spend a moment sort of talking about what that means. So what it means is we um, have a, a wide range of capabilities in the solution, and but what we don't do is we don't sort of force you to take them all on board all at once. In fact, the solution is designed for you to kind of start small, start your risk journey early, and gradually, as you mature your risk uh, management approaches and build on those uh, that approach, the software will build and develop and grow with you. Uh, our solution generates high return on investments. It um, tends to have high user adoption and provides high level of assurance that your, your business is operating with an appetite. So that kind of unique uh, capability to manage risk and performance and through risk appetite in one solution uh, gives you a lot of confidence that you're, you're doing the right things and, and also helps you engage with the regulator. The solution is um, sort of designed to work, to, to work for all three lines of defense. So because it's on SharePoint, it's very much a business tool. It helps your move your risk management processes to the front line and embed it in the front line, and it becomes a day-to-day -day part of what they do. Um, in, the, in the second line, it gives you the capability to kind of monitor the process. You can see which risk uh, assessments are overdue, what what needs to be updated, that kind of thing, and it also provides you with a whole bunch of alerting and other capabilities to. Uh, Generate, manage the process and also generate insight from your single set of data. And finally, the third line system has a, a um, risk based internal auditing approach built in, so that's catered to the third line of defense, the internal audit function. It's very much a business tool, as I've already said, and built on SharePoint. So, SharePoint's used by a, a, lot, a lot of companies around the world, and there's a huge community of, of people out there who know SharePoint, have knowledge about it, and, and can support it, can support the system, which over time reduces your um, long-term cost for the product. So underpinning the uh, solution is what we would describe as a conceptually sound data model. So this is the data, this is, shows you the data structures that we support. And really it starts off with definition of your business through entities. So you'll define your corporate headquarters, you'll define your divisions, your departments, and your teams. 
as entities. And around each of those entities, you can define your called business drivers, which come directly from your business uh, model, and also your objectives. So defining what's this entity here to achieve? What are, what's that kind of reason for being? What are we trying to deliver? Around objectives, you can then define your KPI. So managing are you on track to deliver those objectives? And any actions, so any improvement actions you need to take to ensure you do deliver. And then we add, add in the sort of the risk management piece, the risk appetite, the key risks, key, key risk indicators, actions, uh, risk assessments, risk events, and then the compliance piece of controls, key control indicators, actions, assessments, and certification. So that blue air, the blue structure is what we would describe as our strategic structure, and it really gives you that ability to focus your organisation around its key objectives, and gives you the high, uh, sort of hierarchy underneath it to support that and embed risk totally in the process. Off to the side, we have our operational neighbours, processes, initiatives, systems, people and roles, and assets. And the key thing to say here is we allow these operations, we enable those operational labels to be defined so that you can use our product not only to kind of look strategically how we're, we're performing and what risk we're running, but also actually take that to a more operational level and look at you know, your operational processes, your operational initiatives. And each of those operational enablers has a structure underneath it like the like the objectives. So for processes, you can have KPIs and actions. You can define risk assess, uh, appetite, you can define your key risks, key risk indicators, etc., etc. Key controls, you can do the same for initiatives. So you have initiatives and KPIs, you have key risks, etc., etc. So you have this very comprehensive framework, and that's what, what we often see is our clients will often start out with just doing using part of that framework, but as they mature their approach and move move along their risk journey, they'll use more and more. From a conduct risk perspective, there is a number of areas where this framework really demonstrates how powerful it is. So in enabling you to capture your business drivers, you can use that capture your business, your business model or describe your business model, the key facets of it. You can capture your customer outcomes, so that you know, they're the same as customer objectives. Talk about your customer risk appetite, key risks of your customer uh, objectives or outcomes, key control around customer outcomes. And you've got that whole framework there and down to the operational level, down to the enablers, so your processes and your customer initiatives, etc., etc. Here's an example of a um, conduct risk dashboard that we put together for a client recently. And this, this is quite a relatively simple dashboard. It's a nice one, though, because you know we've got a couple of uh, high-level conduct risk indicators at the top. Then we've got a definition of each of the customer outcomes. And then we've also defined customer processes and customer uh, and customer related initiatives and put them on one page and showed how we align uh, the operational processes and initiatives to, to our objectives. So this really allows us to demonstrate that we're putting customers at the heart of our strategy and we're reporting and structuring our MI to reflect that. Another couple of screenshots to show you. Um, this is what we call a bubble up dashboard. So what it's showing you, showing, giving us an overview of is how many items are we actually managing? How many, how many risks? How many controls? How many indicators are we actually managing? And then what it's doing is it's bubbling up throughout the whole framework the, the red items. So it's showing me how many red items I have throughout our whole framework. So it's giving me just sort of a heads up and alert where I need to go and investigate. And of course, as you'd expect, you can double click on each one of these and slice and dice them and, and get further details about where the red, red item is, what it is, who's the accountable person, that kind of thing. 
example strategy map. So this is um, showing us a strategy map which is built within our product. Uh, it's quite unique in that I think, believe we're the only enterprise risk management solution that comes with this full performance management suite, including a strategy map. And this allows us on one page, or in this case one screen, to show your organizational objectives and what you're trying to achieve. We color code the objectives by theme, strategic theme, and we also use a little indicator on each of the themes to show us how what the status of our KPIs are, our KRIs, and our KCIs. So really on one page we can get, in, get insight into how we're going from a performance perspective, risk perspective, and a controls perspective. And you know you could have a situation where you are green from a KPI performance management perspective, but red from a risk and controls perspective. So that immediately gives me some more insight than the normal strategy maps because it tells me that whilst we're uh, doing well now in terms of performance, perhaps there's some issues being stored up for the future from, you know, because of risks or, or, or ineffective controls. I mentioned previously the um, risk map, the four quadrant risk map, and we've built that into our software solution. And again, we can just use this to identify where our risks are, see if there's any groupings of risk, that kind of thing. And as you'd expect, you can slice and dice on this and drill through for more information. Solution also has a simple uh, indicator dashboard. So it's based on line of sight. So that means as an as a account or person, I can go to this dashboard and open up and see all the indicators that I'm that I have ultimately accountable uh, ultimate accountability for. I can do the same as a responsible person, consultant, and form. So I can, this dashboard really just gives me just the information I need to, to make my decision. So great if you're heading to a meeting and need to quickly see where you're at. So that brings to a conclusion our presentation. I've got some time for some questions and we've got a few come in via email. So the first one is can you clarify how you represent the business model in your solution. Okay, so um, I talked about uh, both in, in this application having business drivers and strategic objectives, and they link very nicely into the um, FCA's way of regulation that are very focused on business model and strategy. So, business model uh, in our application. We represent the business model through business drivers. So you typically use um, some sort of tool to, to define your business model, perhaps the business model canvas, and from that you'll understand what are the key drivers of, those, of that business model, and you represent those in the system. You can define um, risks around the business model, you can define KPIs, etc. So what you can do is you can use Stratex Point to actually monitor changes in the internal and external environment. We have one client uh, a year or so ago who was very focused on growing their mortgage book in the southeast of England. And one of the things they did is they, they documented that as a business driver in our system and they put some KPIs around that. So they were looking at things like mortgage default rates in the southeast, unemployment rates in the southeast, that kind of thing. So they were monitoring the external environment. Uh, through using the business drivers and, and KPIs associated with that, and that obviously creates potential potential strategic risks. Um, I, I hope that clarifies the question. Second question I have got uh, is related to uh, a strategy map, and basically the question is uh, how widely deployed have we seen the strategy map uh, in general in financial services but uh, more specifically around conduct risk. So uh, the strategy map is an interesting one. It, it kind of tends to ebb and flow in popularity um, and it's been around for around 20 years. It's used quite widely I would say in financial services and, and a lot of firms 
have a strategy map or something similar kind of knocking about. I may not call it a strategy map, but it's it's kind of a collection of objectives and typically there's some structure there based loosely on the strategy map. Um, we haven't seen it widely used in a conduct uh, risk perspective. However, um, in the projects that we've done over the last sort of six, eight months, we always start our project by defining business objectives and then specifically customer perspective, uh, objectives, so you know, defining your customer outcomes. So that's the starting point of all of our conduct risk projects. And what we can say is we have had very, very positive feedback from clients about the use of the strategy map in the context of conduct risk. And we've also had quite favourable comments uh, from regulators about the potential to use conduct risk to demonstrate that you're putting customers at the heart of your strategy and, and um, really managing the delivery of your customer outcomes. So um, uh, if you engage with us, I'm sure we can put together a very nice strategy map for you as well in that area. I think it's a great tool to start your con starting point for your conduct risk uh, activities or framework. Okay, so no more questions. So I'll just go on. Uh, I just want to discuss um, a proposition we have, which is called the Stratex Conduct Risk Quick Start. And really, this is a kind of a pre-built solution designed to help you move forward on conduct risk and deliver an effective approach very fast at a low cost with guaranteed delivery. Uh, it's made up of kind of a template of sort of a starter for team template of customer uh, related objectives and risks and controls and things. Um, we have very clear deliverables uh, as part of the project and um, we typically do that, we typically deliver within the 30 to 90 day time frame and that's dependent on an initial scope to really determine uh, and you know what size of organization we're talking about, what's the real scope of the project, that kind of thing. Key point here is guaranteed delivery. If you're not happy, you get your money back. This is a, a kind of overview of the kind of phases and stages we go through. So we start off with um, what we call the discovery phase. So that's really you know, discovery workshops, understanding kind of the organization, understanding their clients in a little bit more detail and really determining what's the scope of the exercise. Um, we then install the software and get that kind of all up and running, get all the reporting running, and you sort of typically have to go through a, a UAT and a live environment. Then we deploy um, the template that we've produced, and that's kind of a good starting point for conversations around um, any uh, requirements gathering and, and looking at existing um, data that you may have uh, or frameworks you may have around conduct. Once we've kind of determined whether that data needs to go or not, we import that into the system so you don't lose data um, unless you choose to do that, take that approach. And then we move into the build phase of really fleshing out your framework, making sure that you have a good uh, risk framework and specifically uh, customer outcomes defined, business model defined that kind of thing. And then we get into, once that's completed, that build phase is completed, we then move into kind of a, a deployment and handover phase where we're focused on uh, making sure that you have one a single reporting pack, a conduct risk reporting pack produced and ready to go at the end of the project. And that's in addition to all the standard reports and dashboards that come with our solution. We also uh, focus in on training, so typically at least one day's training for all your administrative staff and then a, a two day power user course and we typically do two or three of those during this implementation to cover off all the users. And the other thing that we do is we will work with you to really map out the next 90 days for you. So really understand you know, when, when we bring the project to an end, what are the key things that need to take place in the next 90 days to ensure that the product becomes embedded and really 
can't be well used and, and adding a lot of value to the to, to your business. As part of that 90 day roadmap, we will actually come back um, at the end of it and actually redo that exercise. So check how far you've progressed and make sure things are going okay, but then also do another 90 day roadmap so that for in that first six months of having the solution, you have a lot of support from us and we'll be engaged with you on a kind of a, a regular basis to understand that you are rolling it out and deploying the product and getting the value that you want from it. Then handover takes place, so the solution is handed over to your team to manage and run, uh, moving from sort of project phase to production phase. And just from a kind of a technical point of view, from an administrative point of view, because the solution is built on SharePoint, from an administration perspective, we're just another SharePoint site that needs to be administered, so there's no special pro uh, processes need to be created, or nothing, nothing really additional. We're just managed as part of the SharePoint environment. Uh, some details about the deliverable. So, you know, kind of key deliverables is obviously the software solution, the sort of dashboarding space. There's lots of nice dashboards and good reports and you know, red, amber, greens. And really key things are, you know, produce a conduct risk strategy map, risk map, uh, appetite uh, statements, performance and risk scorecards, risk registers, control registers, etc. So there's a sort of a starting point there ready to go, but then we build that out for each individual organization. And of course I already mentioned the RACI model, that's embedded within our solution, so part of the first deployment is really defining who are the accountable people for each risk, who are the responsibles, etc. So the, the Stratix uh, Conduct Risk Quick Start, really it's it's a starting point, uh, focused in, we focus heavy in sort of scoping and really understand the organization early, and then building on what you've already got to deliver you a very effective solution very quickly. Um, we create 90 day roadmaps so that we, we can kind of be engaged for 90 days um, and support you if you take over the product and, and deploy and its deployment. We start off with a standard pack of 25 licenses. We can, if that's too many, too little, we can negotiate around that. And the key thing is this this quick start is deployed by experienced business consultant, technical consultant, and we always put a project manager in to help make sure that we we tick off our tasks as we go. And typically that, that person would only be project manager there 50 percent of his time, her time. Uh, if it's a larger project that might increase to 100 percent of a smaller project it might decrease to 20 percent. Typically there are 30 to 90 day projects and that's all depending on scope. The key point is um, money back guarantee. Here's my contact details. Uh, please feel free to contact me or any any member of the Stratex team, and um, we can talk about conduct risk and if the conduct risk um, quick start would be of interest. Thank you for your time, and once again, uh, apologies for the late start due to technical reasons. Thank you.